This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Do you have an idea for a blockchain app but are worried about the time and cost it will take to develop? The new Azure Blockchain Dev Kit is a free download that brings together the tools you need to get your first app running in less than 30 minutes. Learn more at aka.ms slash epicenter. And by Cosmos. Cosmos is building the Internet of Blockchains, an ecosystem where thousands of blockchains can interoperate, creating the foundation for a new token economy. If you have an idea for a dApp, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter to learn more and to get in touch with the Cosmos team. Hi, welcome to Epicenter. My name is Sebastian Kuchu. And my name is Sunny Agarwal. Hi, Sunny. Uh, how's your trip in Europe going? Uh, it's going pretty well. Uh, you know, on the fourth leg now, I'm here in London uh, recording this. Um, and, you know, we had a great time. Cosmos launched while I was in uh, Switzerland, and so that was fun. And, you know, dealing, uh, everything's been going well on that side. And it's been a very fun and exciting trip. So tell tell our listeners uh, a little bit about uh, the Cosmos launch and what what has been that experience like uh, for you working at Cosmos uh, in the last week. It's been very real, as in that, like I don't know, it just feels so weird that there is this like public blockchain that I have code that I you know I coded, and it's like people are like doing stuff with like real economic value on it. And it just feels very weird to me and. Uh, but no, I'm very excited because, you know, the system has been running smoothly. There has been no halts of the system, no bugs found. Um, not out of all the validators, no one has even gotten slashed yet. You know, I was worried that some validators might misconfigure something and someone will get accidentally slashed. And so, you know, uh, you know, Brian and Mahir's validator chorus has been doing quite well. Uh, I have a validator called Sika, which is also doing quite well. So, you know, it's overall just been a really good experience. Yeah, I, I've been staking my atoms. Uh, disclaimer: I have atoms, uh, and uh, yeah, it's been it's been interesting. It's kind of cool to see, yeah, to see the 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 rewards accumulating there. I'm really interested uh, in seeing like the, the first proposals come through. I think there's one proposal to fix the block time, something like that. So it'd be really interesting to see that you know that that whole process unfolding with the voting and everything. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's really really exciting to to see Cosmos Cosmos finally launching. Um, so I think you had an announcement to make about some speaking engagements you have coming up. Uh, yeah, so I'll actually be at um, EdCon in Sydney at the second week of April. So if anyone, is, any of our, you know, I feel like you know I've never been we've never given our uh, Southern Hemisphere listeners some love, and so you know if anyone wants to meet up down while I'm down there. Uh, let me know and uh, happy to meet up and, you know, uh, just meet some of you guys. Cool. That should be exciting. Um, and coincidentally, our guest today is from Australia. Uh, doesn't live there, but is from Australia. So our guest today is Jackson Palmer, who is the co-founder of Dogecoin. And when, when we started speaking with him, I thought, like, it's it's crazy that we've never had him on before. I mean, we've talked about Dogecoin quite a bit over the years. And in fact, I was going back into early episodes we did an episode where we mentioned we talked quite a bit about Dogecoin on episode five of Epicenter. So this was 275 weeks ago, in, back in early 2014, just as Dogecoin was launching. Uh, at the same time, it was like Ethereum was also like the white paper was being released. And so, uh, if if you're interested, go back and listen to episode five if you you know want to uh, get a feel for what things were going on back then. Also, get a good laugh because our production value was pretty pretty low. Um, and uh, we were quite quite novice at uh, doing a podcast. Um, but yeah, it was a really fascinating conversation, uh, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, because you know, he started this thing that was kind of a joke and, to him and was, in his mind, you know, he saw it as sort of a rejection of what cryptocurrencies were becoming. But what ended up happening is that Dogecoin ended up being quite successful and having a market capitalization, which at one point was upwards of $2 billion. And the other reason why it's interesting is because he doesn't work in the crypto space. I mean, he works for a software company and which you know doesn't operate in crypto like a you know traditional software company. Um, and uh, and so he can he kind of has this this view of crypto from the outside world and is in some ways kind of critical about where things are going. 
So uh, it was, I thought it was a really fascinating conversation and one that I think uh, everyone will appreciate. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, Dogecoin, you know, like you said, like you said, it, you started off, it started off as a joke, but, you know, I think it actually did a lot of good in the, for the ecosystem. And, you know, I, I say that because personally, uh, the first time I heard about cryptocurrency was because of Dogecoin. Uh, I was in one of my high school classes and one of my friends was telling me, he's like, hey, you know, there's this like digital coin called Dogecoin and it like funded the Jamaican bobsled team. And I I was just like, what? That's so weird. That's like, okay. It was just this like weird joke. And then I like, you know, went home and I'm like, I looked up what is this Dogecoin thing. And then that's kind of really the first time I really heard about Bitcoin in the first place. And so, you know, in a way, Dogecoin helped push me down that path. And so I'm thankful to that, I guess. So Doge, Dogecoin is in part responsible for Cosmos coming into existence because <laughs> without you, Cosmos probably wouldn't, you know, wouldn't be where it is today. It would not, not have existed. And, it, and interestingly, and you know, we go into this in the episode, Jay Kwan actually had quite a, quite of an impact in the very beginning because uh, um, him and, and, and Jackson uh, knew each other and, and Jay also contributed to some discussions on GitHub and anyway, we get into the, into the episode. So here's our interview with Jackson Palmer. We're here today with Jackson Palmer. Jackson is the co-creator of the Dogecoin project. Hi, Jackson. Hey, thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on the show. So let's start by asking uh, the question that we typically ask people uh, who come to the podcast. How did you first get involved in crypto? Yeah, I I read about crypto, well, specifically the Bitcoin white paper, like I would say 2011, 2012, when I saw it posted on Hacker News probably. Um, but I kind of dismissed it because I was in Australia back then. Um, that's where I'm born and raised. Uh, and the internet is so bad back in Australia um, that just downloading a blockchain, even if it's a few gigabytes, was un unrealistic over a poor ADSL connection back then. And so I dismissed it until uh, around 2013. Um, and then somebody uh, that I was working with actually was really into uh, Litecoin and kind of pumping Litecoin when it was doing its first uh, uh, first big pump, I think, uh, I think it might've gotten up towards, uh, $30 or something. And, uh, so I like, okay, I got to check this stuff out. I didn't even know there was multiple coins. And, uh, that kind of led me to coinmarketcap.com, which then threw me down the whole spiral of, oh my gosh. Okay. This is, there's a lot, uh, going on here. And so this early interest that you had in crypto, what were you interested in? Were you interested in the technology or more of the financial aspects? Yeah, no, really the technology. Um, I've always been, um, you know, my background is actually in kind of marketing and data and analysis, um, but I've always been extremely technical and developed side projects, etc. And so um, my interest was really just in like I would evaluate any other open source um, kind of software, uh, you know, whether it had legs, whether there was people for, for you know, that would want to use it. Um, and you know, I just looked at it that way, like I look at any other kind of tech startup, really. Um, and uh, as I kind of got into it, I started to realize that maybe it had some interesting kind of political ramifications um, and, and kind of that, that interested me as well, um, you know, regarding like financial institutions and financial crises and things like that. So yeah, that kind of kept me interested for a while. Um, but from the very beginning, I, I have to say I was I was very alarmed um, or uh, skeptical of, of it because of the speculation. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of people I think like to think that um, one at one point in time, I was like a huge, you know, crypto uh, maximalist fan, but that was never really the case. I always came into it with a, a skeptical eye. Um, from the beginning. Were there like, you know, other interesting open source projects or decentralization kind of stuff that you were like really looking into? Like, cause I know, uh, you, you know, I saw on your Twitter the other day, you said you had some guides for like Mastodon and stuff. Uh, so was Bitcoin sort of the first like made like open source project you started looking into or was there other Yeah, not stuff? really. Um, I, I've been like interested and in, in, in kind of involved uh, with, with BitTorrent for, for quite a while and in obviously being a user of BitTorrent. Um, but looking at its applications for peer-to-peer -peer, um, kind of communications and things like that. Never anything that really specifically related to currency because I was like, hey, we've already got this currency thing solved. Like, why, why would I think about that? 
Um, so it was more about communication, file sharing, things like that. Um, you know, a, a project that I launched, uh, I guess, a year before Dogecoin. Um, I was really into memes, um, all, like from the beginning, um, and uh, and gifs. And so I created this this site called gifbase.com, which was was rather popular, um, and actually kind of predated Giphy. Um, I, sh- I should I really should have gone and pitched it to some VCs, um, but I. I, I didn't think about that. So, um, yeah, I've always been kind of involved in software development and, and the memory of it all. Um, and, you know, I guess that that's kind of a nice segue into how Dogecoin came to be. So, yeah, let's let's talk about that. How did uh, your love of open source software uh, have a baby with a dog meme? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, no, I, a lot of it kind of came, you know, that the person that uh, that I knew uh, that was into Litecoin that I was talking about, you know, didn't wasn't the most technical person, and and so that immediately gave me skepticism about a non-technical person shilling something that is that is highly technical. Uh, so I was like, ah, this this seems like gambling. And um, so I went to CoinMarketCap.com, and I noticed that there was like at that point maybe h- under a hundred uh, cryptocurrencies out there, like a lot of the forks um, that, that some of them aren't alive these days. Um, and I noticed a new one was being added pretty regularly, and um, at the same time, the Doge meme was like kind of taking off. And uh, Adrian Chen, uh, a journalist over at Gorka, had written this article basically saying Dogecoin is the best meme. It is uh, not Dogecoin. Doge is the best meme uh, because it's kind of this uncorruptible uh, face. You cannot kind of take uh, Doge and like, you know, Doge can't become Pepe. It's just not going to happen. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, and and uh, you know, not that Pepe was a thing back then, really. But. Um, and so I just had those two kind of tabs open in my browser and, and Doge and coin just kind of blended together. And so <laughs> it started as a tweet, just like me, um, kind of in Australia, we have this thing called taking the piss, um, which is really just kind of throwing shade at something or just like making fun of something. And, uh, I just, you know, did this piss take tweet, uh, where I was like, going to invest in Doge coin. I think it's the next big thing. And, uh, that, that kind of sparked the whole thing that's interesting it, and when you when you took this piss of a tweet um what was the reaction <laughs> take like? of a tweet yeah it's a <laughs> australian slang flying around here but yeah um the reaction was very much um a lot of there were a few people that were like oh my god create this um and then i guess it got shared around in some like crypto circles on irc and stuff um i very immediately i'm, I'm one of those person that if i people that if I have an idea, I'm like, I got to buy the domain name. So I have like way too many domain names. Like I know there's a lot of other people that have similar uh, addictions, uh, addiction <laughs> to this. Same oh, it's I had, so, I had the same addiction at some point in my life. Such yeah. a waste of money, right? Anyway, so uh, I was like, I'm going to, you know, register the domain dogecoin.com because somebody else is going to steal it. So I may as well. Um, and then I just put, I, I went into kind of Photoshop and put a, you know, a 50% opacity image of the the dog over a like a Google image search of a coin and just threw it up on like this static HTML page. Um, and it just said, you know, Dogecoin is the parody cryptocurrency favored by Shiba Inus worldwide. And um, and I didn't think much of it. I was just like, it was a joke. And a lot of it was a joke between me and my friends as well, because like we were all kind of making fun of crypto back then. Um, and so we share it around like whenever anybody asks about Bitcoin, I'm like, haha, look, Dogecoin. And then in this hyper condensed period of time, um, that kind of got shared more and more and more and more within actual crypto circles and IRC and stuff. And then this random dude uh, called Billy uh, pings me on Twitter with a screenshot and is like, hey, uh, you can change the, the, the font in the Bitcoin uh, QT client to Comic Sans. We should make this a real thing. And so that kind of, you know, was led me down the, the spiral. So how did like, um, you know, Billy saw your tweet or something? And so is it someone you knew or like a friend of yours? Yeah. So the website itself, I think, had my Twitter handle on it and uh, it got shared in IRC. And so he just, you know, put two and two together. And that's that's how he got connected. Um, And so, yeah, he he reached out to me. Uh, We added each other on like a Google chat or something. Um, And then. Very rapidly, you know, I think I made the tweet on uh, the 27th, I think, of November in 2013, I want to say. And I think within about five or six days, there was a uh, there was a binary released for, for Dogecoin. 
I see. And I remember, uh, so you mentioned to me before the show that Billy was actually, uh, you know, an, an anonymous guy. Yeah. Uh, do you do you by any chance know at all who he is? Or Oh, uh, yeah. No, I, I know who he is, and I've met him several times uh, okay. in person. Um, but uh, it's uh, a lot of people, it, it, it's very interesting, actually. He's kind of a, a faceless name, um, which I think is how he prefers to keep it. Um, and he got out of the project very early on, I think. Uh, you know, he didn't really want to... Uh, create a new cryptocurrency because you know a lot of people say I'm skeptical of cryptocurrency. He's even more of a skeptic than I am of cryptocurrency. Like, um, and then that's what we we were having a lot of these conversations when we first met online. Um, and so yeah, he is you know it's kind of this sh- not shadowy figure, but he doesn't hasn't played a role in it really outside of the first couple of months of the project. I see. And so you know he's the one who kind of like. Uh, you know, you started it as this joke, but then he's the one who's like, oh, wait, you know, there's here's the, the open source code base. Let's actually start playing around with it. Yeah, yeah. So basically the the what happened was that I kind of came up with a name and the, and the idea. And then we kind of brainstormed over the next few days. We're like, how do we make this as ridiculous as possible? Because we even had the foresight. We were like, you know, he especially was like, we don't want to make this something that people actually care about. This should be something that people don't care about. So how do we make it? as undesirable as a as a cryptocurrency so that it doesn't become serious. Um, and so, you know, you were asking me before the show, like, why did we just dis- why was the, their decision to um, fork Lucky Coin, which was itself a fork of Litecoin, which itself is a fork of, of Bitcoin. And that's because Lucky Coin had this whole notion of uh, random block rewards um, built in. And so our whole thing with, with, with Dogecoin is like, how do we make this so that miners are going to get angry with it and not keep mining it because it can't be profitable? I know. Let's put a random block reward between zero and one million for every block. Um, so it's like totally a gamble, right? Um, like nobody would, nobody serious would ever actually mine that, right? Um, and, and that was supposed to be a protection system so that it didn't become a thing. Um, Unfortunately, it didn't really work as, as intended. Um, so we made some is decisions. Is that still like in that. there? No. So so that, that was eventually removed because it was causing um, a variety of problems, um, and and people didn't like it. <laughs> but uh, you know, and we, we ended up with a um, actual kind of block reward schedule. But um, we made all these kind of like wacky decisions, like 100 billion coins, all this stuff. Um, and then he did the coding work. So I didn't touch like for the 1.0 and I think the 1.1, uh, I didn't touch the code to begin with. Um, he did that work um, and then just shipped it up on Bitcoin Talk um, and, and GitHub. And l- talk about the initial release of, of like the, when this first binary came out and you know, how did it become this thing? Because in a very condensed period of time, so you said that late November 2013, this thing emerged. And then I think early December is when the network launched. And I mean, I was talking to you about this before the show in early 2014, when Epicenter was just starting on episode five, we did an episode where we talk about the Jamaican bobsled team sponsorship. So within within the uh, the amount of like eight weeks already, the community there was enough Dogecoin going around, and it had sufficient value for people to be s- sponsoring you know Olympic teams with th- <laughs> you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Like, what happened there? How did this thing become such a? a I think hit it was a right place, time? right time kind of thing. Um, in that, uh, you know. That time at the end of 2013, that was kind of Bitcoin's first big run up. And, um, you know, I think it hit $1,000 and everybody was super excited. Um, it was shortly followed by the Gox thing. But, um, you know, at that point of time, there was so much interest in crypto. But the difference between, say, 2013 and 2017 is that all the people that were interested in it weren't just speculators, they were developers. Right. And so um, I think when when Dogecoin came out and it was on Bitcoin talk, which is like obviously very popular with with developers and people that are more technical in nature, um, the there was just this community of people that that were like, hey, finally, here's like a thing we can play around with. Um, I think that uh, Dogecoin didn't have any value at that point. It wasn't on an exchange or anything like that. And so people were like, 
hey, like this is cool, a cool way that we can learn how to interface with, say, the Bitcoin uh, D kind of JSON RPC. Uh, you know, we can do all this stuff with a real live mainnet um, without the worry of losing money on the Bitcoin mainnet, especially at the time because Bitcoin was so expensive. Um, you know, so expensive, a thousand dollars. But you know, uh, so I just think it was a right place, right time thing. And and very quickly after it launched, you know, so this is a thing like Billy and I, we didn't even, you know, he had a, an Nvidia GPU that could do CUDA mining. I didn't have a, a good GPU at that time, and so he like just put his uh, miner, pointed his miner at it. Um, uh, there was no pre mine or anything. Uh, pointed at it for like the first twenty four hours after the the mainnet launch. And um, within 24 hours, like the hash rate was just like it was it was too much. You couldn't solo mine anymore. It was like you had to pull mine and all these pulls popped up. The tip bot on Reddit popped up like in the space of about a week after it launched. And I think it was just because right place, right time, like the developers were there um, and ready to go. This episode of Epicenter is brought to you by Microsoft and the Azure Blockchain Workbench. Getting your blockchain from the whiteboard to production can be a big undertaking. And something as simple as connecting your blockchain to IoT devices or existing ERP systems is a project in itself. Well, the folks at Microsoft have you covered. You already know about the Azure Blockchain Workbench and how easy it makes bootstrapping your blockchain network pre-configured with all the cloud services you need for your enterprise app. Their new development kit is the IFTTT for blockchains. Suppose you want to collect data from someone in a remote location via SMS, and have that data packaged in a transaction for your Hyperledger Fabric blockchain. The development kit allows you to build this integration in just a few steps in a simple drag and drop interface. Here's another great example. Perhaps you're an institution working with Ethereum and rely on CSV files sent by email. One click in the dev kit and you can parse these files and have the data embedded in transactions. Whatever you're working with, the dev kit can read, transform, and act on the data. To learn more and to build your first application in less than 30 minutes, visit aka.ms slash epicenter. And be sure to follow them on Twitter at MSFT Blockchain. We'd like to thank Microsoft and Azure for their support of Epicenter. So on the topic of, of community, uh, so th this, this community of developers uh, came around the project and the Reddit community also blew up. And you know, I, maybe in part this, this Reddit tip but uh, had a had a role to play with it. Dogecoin sort of quickly became this this uniquely altruistic community within the crypto space. Uh, so we mentioned the uh, Jamaican bobsled team um, uh, sponsorship. There was some other Olympic team, I think, that which was sponsored. You know, Dogecoin has been involved in funding whales in Kenya and, and all these other things. Did you play a role in initiating this this altruistic nature in the community? Yeah, is it something uh, yeah. that came elsewhere? Did you did you see that come? Where, where did that emerge from? I think it was actually a combination of of, of me, but also Billy. Um, in that, once we realized it was a real thing, right? Like we 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 thought that we had set the cryptocurrency up in a way that after its launch, people would you know get sick of it after a week and then stop caring about it, right? And that obviously didn't happen. And so at that point, we were kind of like, oh crap. Um, how do we make sure that this thing doesn't just become another, um, you know, kind of not like a thing that people are gambling on, speculating on? Um, because that was like our, one of our biggest, you know, joint criticisms of cryptocurrency and, and something we hated about it. And so um, we thought, you know, w the real way to do that is to just continue um, kind of sharing this message with people that. The thing um, is is lighthearted. The thing is about giving. Um, it's not about getting rich. Um, and so, just I think through that kind of messaging, um, it it just bubbled up to people saying, "Hey, we should sponsor things. Hey, we should donate these things. Um, you know, uh, it might not be worth a lot of money, but maybe we can help." Um, and uh, so there was the the Jamaican bobsled team. And as soon as that happened. You know, I had a friend back in Australia and I was like, you know, I was working a full time job during all of this, by the way. And so I was I said to my friend, hey, do you want to like help with the, the Reddit community and like, you know, uh, organizing, you know, <laughs> sponsoring the Jamaican bobsled team? And so then we did a several things like that, um, but it was all community driven. It was all honestly not me. It was the community. Um, and um, I think it, it highlighted the power in a way like this is the one 
thing that kind of, you know, I was, as I said, I was skeptical coming into this. The one thing that got me interested in, in crypto, like that, that Dogecoin helped further my interest was, um, you know, you have a community of say a hundred thousand people on the Dogecoin subreddit back then. That's what it was at. And, um, you know, if, if you give those people an easy way to, uh, give 20 cents, right. Or, or 50 cents, let's say 50 cents. Um, in, in a way that there's, you know, very little to no transaction fee. It's rather instant, secure, all of that stuff. Make it easy for people. And the Reddit tip bot allowed them to do this. Um, then you have $50,000 there that you can give to, you know, a charitable cause or something like that. And so the power of that is actually like the one thing that kind of drew me in further with, with Dogecoin um, or into crypto in general is the kind of like, the use of it for for altruism and and, and kind of bettering society um and i i thought and i had hoped that that would be the direction that it kept going in um but uh you know despite best efforts i think of several community leaders and the dogecoin foundation and everybody to keep it to being this charitable lighthearted thing um i think the lesson we've all learned with cryptocurrency is that all roads lead back to you know uh, speculation uh price uh, gambling. Um, it's very hard to, uh, force people or force a community to not, uh, have inertia towards that. And so that's unfortunately what, you know, like all other cryptocurrencies, Dogecoin ended up descending into. So, you know, one of the other people who you know, I'm friends with in the crypto space, who's also really into this whole, like, um, altruistic nature of cryptocurrency is, uh, Griff Green from the Giveth Project. And so, you know, he often tells me a lot about how he's very inspired by like the burning man culture and this like, na this like, you know, idea of like gift giving culture and stuff. So what I, and I've actually never been to burning man myself, but you know, uh, he, he, he seems to love that experience and that, that the community that that's built around that, uh, was this at all an inspiration for you? Or are you, are you like, have you ever participated in that or? No, honestly, I think burners are the worst, but <laughs> oh, interesting. Uh, no, it, it, it's kind of just uh, not really because, you know, I, I, I don't really think of uh, burnerism, burnerism kind of uh, altruism is, is in, in a way, I think a fake altruism because it's a lot of people, you know, there, there, there's billionaires there with like private jets <laughs> at, at, at Burning Man. So is it really a, an event for the people? Probably not. No, I wasn't really inspired by that. I was more inspired by just um, you know, I've always kind of believed in um, redistribution of wealth, um, of uh, social causes. Um, and so I think I came into it with that. Um, and, you know, also, I just think in Australia, there is more of an emphasis on that. That was one thing that surprised me when I moved to America is that there seems to be a lot of a less uh, less of a focus or an a will, a acceptance of, of social systems um, uh, than opposed to, say, Australia or other you know European places and stuff like that. So. Um, definitely not inspired by Burning Man. But. <laughs> gotcha. And so, you know, kind of asked to delve into that a little bit more. Like, you know, I know on your Twitter, um, you kind of do mention sometimes, like, you know, more, uh, I don't know if you, like, socialistic, like, you know, you have, like, a little different uh, philosophy, political philosophy than, you know, the prevalent Bitcoin political philosophy, we could say. And I'm not sure if you ever actually used the word communistic, but I feel maybe you used the word socialistic and, like, um, Kind of like, I guess, where did you see, like, you know, did, is, was that like, you know, aversion to the Bitcoin political philosophy, what kind of led to this? And then also, how do you see like Ethereum's like community in relation to that? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's a really good question. I think, um, you know, I, I, I haven't always had the, the clearest, um, kind of political thoughts. I don't think a lot of people do. I think that there's, there's typically, uh, political beliefs or a journey that you that develop over time. Um, and, um, I think that, um, when you live in a country like Australia or, or some, a place that has pretty good, um, welfare systems, but is still, uh, very much a capitalist society, um, you kind of fall into this kind of like centrist liberalism where everything's comfortable, right? Um, I, I like to tell people that I, moving to America made me a socialist, um, because, uh, you, you, you know, moving, moving here really, uh, demonstrated to me. Uh, you know, the, the inequalities of capitalism, right? Um, which weren't as so pronounced uh, in, 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 a, in a more liberal centrist uh, community such as Australia. And so- Not, um, not just America, specifically San Francisco where- you know, Well, specifically San Francisco is, is like the ultra, uh, you know, version of that, right? You have people riding around on like, 
you know, thousand dollar like hoverboards and scooters and they're dodging like homeless people. It's it's absolutely nuts. Um, but uh, I think Bitcoin actually did, you know, I felt early on was more aligned with um, some, you know, kind of anti-capitalist, anti-institution um, kind of uh, belief systems. Like I used to know a lot of people that were in crypto. Some of the people that were in early um, early Dogecoin as well were came from the Occupy movement um, uh, in New York. Um, and um, there's this person, Ben Dornberg, who was, um, you know, really into into Dogecoin um, was great and, 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 and had a lot of these beliefs. And actually, I think uh, was helped with the chapter of Occupy. Those people all kind of got you know, not shouted away, but disheart- you know, disheartened by where Bitcoin moved um, because um, there's, there's two kind of uh, ways, of, I think, of looking at, at institutions um, and, and, and all of this. And I think, uh, unfortunately, Bitcoin has trended a lot more towards being this kind of ANCAP, you know, uh, like very hyper capitalist kind of still anti-state, but but uh, also hyper capitalist, um, system. Um, and I don't think a lot of people that are subscribed to that belief really realize that, uh, the big institutions, uh, you know, that that's part of the system that they're promoting. So it, it's an interesting dynamic, but yeah, um, definitely identify as kind of socialist, a student of Marx and, uh, yeah. I, I would tend to agree with you there uh and recently was discussing this with with someone uh who who comes from that uh, that side of bitcoin and i guess like an early bitcoiner and and this is somewhat represented i think sometimes in like memes between bitcoin and ethereum where and uh, you know i, I don't want to cast judgment on anyone but where bitcoin is seen as this very like the right li- right wing libertarian uh, flavor, I guess, of libertarianism, where it's highly individualistic, uh, but highly capitalistic, and maybe Ethereum is somewhere else on that spectrum. I wouldn't say totally, uh, you know, left 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 wing uh, idealistic and and, uh, and and libertarian, but um, there there is very much uh, a difference there in terms of political ideology that they, that shines through quite a bit and. And uh, and Dogecoin maybe was more, I guess, on the altruistic side and less on the capitalistic side. So maybe even not on that spectrum, but somewhere else on another axis. <laughs> Dogecoin has its uh, own like Z axis, you know. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> but uh, no, you're absolutely right. Like I think Ethereum and the people, this is one of the reasons I really like the Ethereum community. And typically why I like uh, communities that aren't maximalist in nature, people that are like open to any cryptocurrency, um, is, is really because uh, they... They typically have a, a, a broader, more educated belief system. Um, and, and I think Vitalik, I think Vlad, a lot of the people I met from the Ethereum um, community, um, I, I definitely, uh, you know, align to a certain degree with politically more so than I do like the Bitcoin maximalists that only eat meat, you know, <laughs> um, because they also, you know, there's this, there's this strange thing where the, all those carnivores seem to have a very certain set of political beliefs as well, which is kind of strange that, that one's diet would represent their political beliefs. But um, yeah, it, it's an interesting dynamic. And it's something that I feel is only, and maybe it was always there, but I feel like it's something that's maybe been more polarized um, or uh, uh, kind of just come to light more um, in this kind of like whole like boom and bust cycle. The bear market is people's kind of true colors. The factions have kind of uh, become very clear. You mentioned the Dogecoin Foundation uh, a few minutes ago. Tell us what what's what's this all about and what's the story behind this foundation? So the Dogecoin Foundation was a loosely, extremely loosely organized um, group of people, kind of community volunteers, who just tried to steer the community. It was basically the Reddit mods, <laughs> uh, kind of uh, saying, "Hey, here, like we have a community of people that want to." Um, throw small chunks of money at at good causes. Um, how do we give it a boost? Um, and so uh, there was a bunch of volunteers that did that. Um, ben Dornberg, who I mentioned previously, was one of them. Um, who played a very big part in that. Um, and uh, then what happened after that was that there was kind of a lot of turmoil. Um, you know, so so I said that we did a bunch of altruistic things. We did the Jamaican bobsled team. We did another thing, which is probably what I'm most proud of, um, which was called Doge for Kids. Um, 
and that whole project was all about uh, raising money for uh, training dogs, uh, uh, assistance dogs for blind and autistic children, um, which is honestly, I think, the best thing that Dogecoin's ever done to give back to the world. Um, and uh, then we did Doge for Water, uh, which was uh, working with Charity Water to build wells in Kenya. Um, Eric Nakagawa, who actually created ICANHasCheeseburger.com, was the one that ran that. So lots of meme overlaps. Um, and uh, beyond that, then you probably have heard about the NASCAR, right? Like that's the thing that you know, I actually don't like to talk about a lot um, because uh, that was when there was this, you know, we started to see this influx of more uh, people concerned with price fluctuations, people getting greedy. Um, and uh, there was this this third party uh, kind of company that latched onto the Dogecoin community called Moolah. Um, and a lot of people probably know the full story there. But in a nutshell, um, the whole thing was a scam. Um, and uh, they unfortunately were one of the biggest funders of the NASCAR and kind of tried to co-opt the foundation, and co-opt the community, um, take all that goodwill and instead try and point it towards funding their scam. And so that kind of blew up in the face of the Dogecoin community. Um, and that's when I and many others just kind of walked away and was like, you know, we don't want involvement with this anymore. This is this is nuts, um, especially because we'd warned the community before all of this happened not to trust this company. Um, but, you know, people don't listen. Well, maybe can you talk a bit more about that? Because yep. I'm not fully uh, like clear on what happened there. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this is a it's a story. Uh, so uh, there was this company called Moolah um, that uh, kind of came out with uh, essentially kind of a Shopify, like an e-commerce experience, very lightweight, very buggy, uh, that, that accepted several cryptocurrencies, I think. But mostly Dogecoin was the, the market they went after. Um, and it had this kind of mysterious figure at, at, at its helm uh, who went by the name Alex Green. Um, and, you know, what a fake name, right? And he was obvious and he was very active on, on the Reddit community, on the IRC, several places. Um, and back in 2014, they announced this thing called Moolah Pi, uh, which was basically, it's kind of like an ICO in a way. You, you would basically send them Dogecoin um, and you would get like a GPG signature um, that was then your, your stake, your, your holdings in that company, right? So obvious scam to any rational person. Um, but a lot of people uh, to the tune of about $750,000, if I remember correctly, sent money to this the, these scammers. Um, and um, at first, like I was a little bit skeptical as I was like, oh, this is bad. Um, and uh, we got super skeptical when they started sponsoring events like throwing around huge sums of money. People started saying they were getting dividends <laughs> so they would get paid back money. I'm like, oh gosh, like classic Ponzi, right? Like it's, it's clear what's going on here. Um, but because these people were giving back dividends and they, they'd go into like the, the IRC channels and they'd shower everybody in Dogecoin tips, the community loved them. As soon as, you know, myself or anybody else was like, hey guys, maybe practice some healthy skepticism with this. Um, they're like, how dare you, you know, leave Mular alone. They're great people, yada, yada, yada. Um, so eventually I and others got shouted out of the community. People were just like, shut up, Jackson. You don't know what you're talking about. Mular is the best. Um, and Mular did the NASCAR, um, you know, which they also got their logo on, which a lot of people don't like to talk about. Um, and then flash forward a few months. Um, this is a, actually a really interesting story. So, um, Ben Dornberg and myself, um, as all this was going down, uh, basically got met, tried to get them on a Skype call so we could see this guy's face because nobody had ever seen this Alex Green's face, right? And uh, so um, we we finally convinced him to get on a Skype call and he's like threatening us, basically saying, you know, you guys should stop questioning me because you, you know what typical scammers are like, right? Like the Craig, uh, Craig Wrights of the world, they'll, uh, they'll threaten to sue you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, somebody in that call, I don't know who it was, um, it actually wasn't me, recorded that call and posted it on YouTube. Um, and so everybody knew all of a sudden what this guy's face was like. Still, nobody knew who he was, unfortunately. Flash forward a few months after that call, and surprise, surprise, Moolah announces that they've gone bankrupt. They got hacked or something. The guy lost the keys, you know, the typical thing. Sorry, all your money's gone. And uh, they'd actually bought a, an exchange at the time as well called MintPal and run off with all the money from that exchange as well. And I didn't come back, you know, I could have come back and been like, told you so, guys, humble pie, all of that. But I didn't. I kind of waited in the wings. And uh, so TechCrunch, surprisingly, ran a news article that was 
just about this moolah going bankrupt because it was a pretty big deal. It was a few million dollars missing, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess because TechCrunch didn't have any other images of this guy, they went to this YouTube video of the Skype call and screenshotted his face. Because of that, some ex-girlfriend of, of, of this, this scammer in, in the UK <laughs> randomly emails me out of the blue and is like, that's not Alex Green. His name's Ryan Kennedy and he's a serial scam artist. He had a whole Encyclopedia Dramatica, uh, you know, like page written all about him. He was running Magic the Gathering scams. Like, of course, right? You know, so so on brand with Bitcoin. And, uh, and so, and there was a whole bunch of info. And so this all kind of got shared out. Um, and Ben and I were like, hey folks, maybe you should look up the name Ryan Kennedy. And then uh, Mueller employees started coming out and saying, oh yeah, we knew his name was Ryan Kennedy. I'm like, how do you not know that's a scam? So all of this happened and it kind of imploded the community as you would imagine. Um, and uh, at the same time, I wasn't really welcome back because people were like, oh yeah, you were right, Jackson. But a lot of people don't like to admit that. So that's the history in a nutshell. What was like the time frame that this was happening? This all happened in a year. This was 2014. It was an extremely busy year. And so it was like same around time as Mount Gox drama and whatnot. Yeah, it was like, well. I would say it happened six to eight months after the Gox thing. Okay. So, you know, it seems that, you know, like you said, the, the community kind of had this like implosion for a while. But, you know, I, uh, when I actually met you for the first time, it was at uh, DogeCon, which is this like really fascinating conference I've been to, I went to. It was last year, I think in June or so, June 2018. Um, it was held by this uh, co-working space in Vancouver called Decentral or Decontrol. Um, and very fascinating community, but they held this like conference just on Dogecon. And I will say it was not the most educational conference I've been to. It was not the most academic or productive conference I've been to. But it was definitely the most fun conference I went to. Absolutely. And, you know, we had these like decentralized dance parties and like like you know scavenger hunts and it, it was a lot of fun. So you know, do you uh, do you know how like this whole decentral community kind of you know? And I, you know, I went I went to their hacker space and they have like paintings of like the Doge God or uh, like on their thing. And so do you know how these guys kind of like kind of. I don't know, it seems like they are kind of trying to revive the community and kind of like the more fun loving aspect of it. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's a revival so much as it just is a they always are into into Doge uh, coin. And I think that the Doge Con, um, although it was the name of the conference, there was a lot of stuff other than Doge coin talked about there. Like, I don't know if Doge coin was really even talked about the most um, out of uh, all the things there. It was it, it's cool because I think to me, um, after all of those speculators, the greedy people kind of got flushed out of the Dogecoin community after all that drama I was talking about. I think um, the the OGs were left, right? Like the original people that were in it for the memes, in it for the fun, were left over. Typically a, a more technical group of people as well, a bit nerdy, a bit geeky. Um, and so it was kind of nice because it was kind of a return to roots, if anything. Um, and, uh, yeah, they reached out to me and said, Hey, do you want to come up to Vancouver for this, this conference we're running? And I, I honestly, I didn't think they'd have that many people, but there ended up being a lot of people there, um, which, which really surprised me. And, um, yeah, I think it's just, you know, people, people like memes and I, I it, you, you'll sometimes see, you know, Vitalik, for instance, uh, often, uh, wearing a Doge shirt or something like that. Uh, he's a big fan of it as well. Like the meme in general. Um, I think Doge, uh, it, you know, separately to, to Dogecoin, um, but also just Dogecoin being under that umbrella, just represent um, the belief that there should be lightheartedness and humor and community and um, togetherness um, just, you know, within open source software. And I think it, it's kind of used as a, as a symbol in a way, like the symbolism to, to represent people who are like-minded in that belief. And so to me, that conference was just bringing those people together. So yeah, that was a lot of fun. I, it was the weirdest and wackiest crypto conference I've ever been to, but that was cool. Yeah. I mean, like you said, like, you know, I, I don't know how much we actually talked about Dogecoin specifically, <laughs> but like, I think what it really did was by like calling it Dogecoin, 
it attracted a certain type of person to the conference, just like just these very fun people, essentially, and like who were there to have a good time. And so there was there was a panel for memory on like the deconstructing memes, like memeology, and there was a there was a potty shaman there. Like it, it was just like it it was just completely different to, to any crypto conference and it was cool because nobody was sitting around talking about ICOs or what 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 to pump you know it was it was just very much down to earth and cool people this episode of epicenter is brought to you by cosmos the internet of blockchains cosmos is live and we couldn't be more excited to see so many projects already building on it blockchain technologies are evolving fast and development shouldn't be one size fits all as a dapp developer you need the tools that will allow your dapp to scale grow, and evolve over time. The Cosmos SDK is a user-friendly, modular framework which allows you to customize your dApp to best suit your needs. It's powered by Tenement Core, an advanced implementation of the BFT proof-of-stake protocol. Cosmos takes care of networking and consensus and allows you to focus on building your application in your language of choice. Ethereum smart contracts will be supported soon, and the SDK makes it simple for you to connect to other blockchains in the Cosmos network. If you have an idea for a dApp, and would like to learn more about the Cosmos SDK, or if you'd like to connect your existing DAP to Cosmos, visit cosmos.network slash epicenter. For Epicenter listeners, the Cosmos team will reach out to answer your questions and help you get started. We'd like to thank Cosmos for their support of Epicenter. The reason I actually wanted to do this episode was um, we kind of, uh, a, few, a few months ago, we did our five-year Epicenter AMA. Uh, episode like anniversary episode and one of the questions was about like you know what coins maintain their value and Brian and I kind of got into a little like back and forth about the value of meme coins and that like and you know by meme coins I don't mean it specifically just like the funny memes like dogecoin but I like just in general this like uh, I, Bitcoin is a meme coin or like Litecoin is a meme that's like the silver to Bitcoin's gold. What does that even mean? No one knows, but it's like somehow imbued it with like billions of dollars of value. And same with Dogecoin at some point, not today, but like, you know, a few months ago, Dogecoin also had billions of dollars of value. And so what do you think, you know, I, I know you seem, you, you, like you said, you're, you're, you're skeptical about this idea of like, you know, the speculation. But do you think that there's any value in like this concept of like memes bringing together a community and value being created from like the fact that an interesting community exists? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's kind of sad to me that communities like that can't exist in lieu of like a market cap. And I think that is the that is the thing that I, I like to try and like separate is um, having a good community from um, you know having a good community because the price right now you know, gets people excited, um, which is actually why I like the bear market in a sense, because it means that the people that are still around are, are, are somewhat genuine um, in, in their beliefs, um, at least. And so it's, um, I, I think that in terms of the those coins existing, like I don't really, my, my challenge with all cryptocurrencies is that I think they're, val they're extremely overvalued. And when you say that Litecoin has billions of dollars at value. It has billions of dollars in nominal value um, that, you know, sitting on a, on coinmarketcap.com with a whole bunch of fake volume. And who knows, you know, uh, what would happen if, if there was actually a, a you know, a, a run um, on that price uh, and people tried to, to sell off. So I don't know, like, I, I feel like I like to separate out the community piece from the money piece. And this is one of the biggest problems, I think, that crypto has is that it's the first kind of software movement where you have um, open source software that has an intrinsic uh, financial incentive attached to it. Um, and uh, most other open source projects have that like BitTorrent um, or say, you know, uh, communities like the Rust community, like for um, the, the, soft, the language Rust. Um, they can flourish and be these really like supportive communities of, of cool developers. Um, they can have codes of conduct. They can do all this cool stuff. Um, and there's no financial incentive attached to that necessarily, right? There's no um, part of that code that they could change to potentially game it in a way that they get more money. And I think that's just a huge, it, it just shifts the incentive schemes for all of this, right? Um, and, and this is like, 
why I have trouble with any cryptocurrency that starts having like very corporate interest. It's why I like had some issues with Blockstream. It's why, you know, I freak out a little bit when I see Jack Dorsey like saying, hey, I'm going to fund Bitcoin core developers. I'm like, oh, interesting. Like, what's the incentive scheme look like there um, for, for how decisions are made? Um, and so I really wish that we could get back to a point where cryptocurrency was treated more just like uh, communities were, were run just more like traditional open source communities. Hard to do, though, because of the financial incentive. So I don't really have a solution for that problem, but I think it's just something that everybody should be aware of because I think there's a lot of bias in this stuff that people don't have a lot of self-reflection on. And kind of then relating a bit to financial and economic incentives, um, you know, one thing that I guess Dogecoin tried to do in order to make it less speculative is it takes a very different approach to monetary policy as opposed to most cryptocurrencies and you know i personally like it a lot where like it's this not hyper deflationary coin and while and you know so could you talk a little and i know actually like you know from what i'm reading uh it, the monetary policy actually changed a couple of times and so could you maybe go into that and like you know you, like we said we started off with that whole lucky coin randomness but then uh what was the decision around like uh making it this more or maybe first, could you maybe describe the monetary policy? So the monetary policy that a lot of people like to talk about with Dogecoin is that um, after it was mined out to 100 billion coins, um, the code uh, it works in such a way that there's a static block reward of $10,000, uh, $10,000, 10,000 Doge <laughs> uh, per block um, into per perpetuity, right? So it's, it's, it's infinite, it's inflationary. Um, but it's deflationary inflation if you think of the rate as the as the total supply. And, um, you know, a lot of people like to think that this was some amazing genius decision that, that I or Billy made. Um, it wasn't. It's actually a bug in, <laughs> in, in the code. So when we defined the, you know, when, when you when you back in the day when you used to like just fork a, a coin and make an old coin, there were a series of magic numbers, right? Some like variables um, in the code. Um, which you would change, like max max money, I think, was the one that we changed. And we just thought that putting 100 billion there would mean that the cap of the coin was 100 billion. We didn't know. <laughs> we didn't know what we were doing. And so, um, funny story, actually, there's, a, there's a, a great GitHub issue thread with literally hundreds of comments on it. Guess who it was started by? Jay Kwan, the founder of Cosmos. Because he pointed out, he was the first person to report this issue. He said, hey, guys, your coin isn't actually capped. <laughs> oh, wow. I did not yeah. know this. Jay never but then Jay, this. Jay suggested, Jay Kwan literally said, I don't think you should remove this bug. I think you should leave it in and have inflation um, to assist with lost coins, um, hacks, things like that. And and just, you know, inflation can, can sometimes be a good thing. So... You know, the genius decision to leave to, to for Dogecoin to be inflationary is actually a product of Jay Kwan. Uh, <laughs> I never knew this. He has never told me about this. That's yeah. so cool. Okay, I guess. And, and then, you know, another interesting uh, event that came along in the like technical timeline of uh, Dogecoin was this uh, decision to start merge mining with mm. Litecoin. And yeah. suddenly that brought a lot of hash power to uh, Dogecoin. And so could you maybe like talk about that? Like, you know, back when that happened, merge mining wasn't a common thing. It's, and it's, I guess it's really still not even that common today even. But, you know, when you ask someone, name two merge mine coins, it's usually Namecoin and Dogecoin. And yeah. So, so yeah, Namecoin name name was the first coin to really do merge mining. I think Satoshi might have even been involved in that um, to, a, to a very early degree. Um, and what merge mining does is it basically takes two uh, cryptocurrency protocols or blockchains that are using the same uh, hashing algorithm for proof of work um, and basically shares that work across the two chains. So you can get a reward, you can submit proofs and secure the network for both of those coins and also receive, receive a block reward on both as well. So it increases your chance of making money for miners. Everybody wins. Um, the... In Dogecoin, what led us there is that Dogecoin being a fork uh, of, of Litecoin and using S-Script as the hashing algorithm like a lot of others do, um, we got to a point in, I would say, it was in 2014, where, um, or maybe 2015, where there was so much hashing power on the Litecoin network, um, but so little on the Dogecoin network that it became very apparent that 
if if just one random uh, you know Litecoin miner with some ASICs wanted to 51% attack Dogecoin, they could in a heartbeat. It would be very easy. Um, and this is the problem with shared you know proof of work algorithms. Um, uh, you know, the 51% attacks happen. Um, and uh, so Charlie Lee, actually uh, creator of Litecoin, actually came to us um, to the the Dogecoin community and said you guys should consider merge mining. It's a great idea. Like you'll inherit our security model. Um, you know, he's a fan of Dogecoin. Um, let's protect it. And at first I was actually pushing back on it quite heavily um, because, uh, you know, Litecoin, the future of Litecoin wasn't super clear back then. Um, Charlie wasn't active on the project. He was working at Coinbase. Um, and, uh, you know, I was worried because when you start merge mining, you, you have to go and convince all the miners to start doing it. And then those two coins are like joined at the hip, right? The success of those coins and the security model is joined at the hip. And I'm like, if Dogecoin does this, it has to, everybody has to accept that if Litecoin fails, Do Dogecoin hence fails, basically, um, or its security model fails. Um, and uh, so I pushed back on that for quite a while. This was in a world where the price of all these cryptocurrencies was a lot lower. And so the, the risk was not uh, as big as it is today. Um, but eventually the community kind of got together and I said, yeah, this is probably a good idea. Um, I didn't have any bearing on it because I, I haven't been the developer on, on, on it for like since early 2014. Um, and uh, so the developers that, that currently maintain it made the changes and organized with all the miners and merge mining was implemented. And ever since it's had extremely uh, good resilience in terms of security. On the topic of development, it seems by looking at the GitHub repo that there hasn't been a whole lot of activity in the last year. And since 2015, I guess, is when activity kind of trickled down. Um, can you talk a bit about that? What are your thoughts here? And how do you think this is affecting the project going forward? Yeah, yeah. So I, after Billy kind of backed away, like after the first month or two of Dogecoin, I suddenly inherited this like unwieldy C++ code base that was based off an old version of Litecoin um, that, you know, had all sorts of known bugs. Um, and it was it was kind of like an oh shit moment. Um, and uh, so I very quickly had to rebase the entire uh, kind of uh, code of, of Dogecoin off, I think it was 0.8.6 of Litecoin um, and and release the, the next few builds. And But I was working with a, a team of uh, kind of contributors, notably one called... Uh, uh, Max, uh, who uh, goes by the handle Langer Hands, and um, we kind of, you know, for a few months there, we're, we're doing most of the development work, patching, you know, pulling in updates from upstream um, code bases like Bitcoin and Litecoin, um, and then over time, I just I didn't have the time. Uh, I didn't have the time because I work a full time job. I'm also not a professional C++ coder. And so I probably didn't have a right to be in there um, fiddling with things. But also, I didn't want to have a control over this system. I didn't want to have um, any kind of say in, in future decisions about it because those decisions can weigh on you. Um, when you're making like decisions like, should we merge mine? Like that's a huge decision that I frankly don't want to have to own. Um, and um, so it was like kind of a lot of back and forth. And then eventually, um, I think it was in either late 2014 or early 2015, um, I handed over full uh, GitHub uh, permissions um, to, uh, to Max and two other developers, um, Patrick and Ross. Um, and uh, they took over. They became the Dogecoin full-time development team. Well, full-time, you know, it's still a hobby for them. But uh, they become the maintainers of it. I removed myself from the GitHub repo, so I have no access um, no permissions and kind of left it to them. And then they stood up, I think a dev fund and a whole bunch of stuff like that, like any crypto, uh, project does. Um, I think what happened was, you know, it's a hobby for them. And you have to remember that after 2015, there was a huge lull in crypto until about 2017 when the whole Ethereum ICO thing happened. And so there just wasn't a good reason to really update the Dogecoin source code. It had, you know, everything was working. Like if it, if it ain't broke, why fix it? Um, and um, then I think there was some renewed interest in, in 2017, 2018 around, um, hey, update, because there might be some critical security issues with the, with the current code base. Um, but, you know, again, 
it's their it's their hobby. It's not their full time job. And so I just think they haven't gotten around to it. Now I get a lot of flack for saying this, but there hasn't been a non beta release of Dogecoin since 2015. Um, you know, since shortly after I left. Um, and uh, that's worrying to me. I think it should be worrying to everybody. Um, but there are some like there is some progress on like some betas um, that I think they're releasing. I think that you have to change the branch on GitHub um, that that Ross claims to to be releasing soon. So we'll see. Um, but in terms of the code base, I would say it's almost in maintenance mode. It's just like security patches only, rather than it being a uh, a new like any new features development or anything like that but again i'm not officially speaking for the project anyway so people don't get cranky at me um yeah so uh, i i don't know exactly when this was but i think it's in the, within the last year I mean, correct me if i'm wrong but uh, there was this announcement that uh, there would be this uh, this side chain on ethereum can you talk a bit about that and it strikes me that maybe having a side an ethereum side chain you know, if everybody moves their Doge over to, to Ethereum, well, you no longer have to maintain the code base for Dogecoin. Yeah. This, <laughs> so for, for many years, people have talked about there being a, a, a Doge to Ethereum bridge um, or a, you know, we even back in the day, Jay Quan and I used to talk about a Tendermint to Doge uh, bridge um, a lot, actually. Um some people, what ended up happening is Vitalik and others actually funded a bounty program. So I think Vitalik and a few others through what ended up being, because the Ethereum price run up, about $100,000 or so um, in bounty just to create a working prototype of the Doge Ether bridge, right? So that, 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 that obviously fueled a whole bunch of excitement because developers were like, hey, there's 100K on the table. Hell, I'm going to do this. Um, so a bunch of people spun up different projects to try and do it. And essentially what it would be is a bridge where you can um, send your Dogecoin over to Ethereum and then it exists on the Ethereum network and send it back and vice versa, right? So um, Dogecoin exists in two places instead of one. And, you know, the, the, the reason that I don't really see a point in this um, is because it would exist as essentially an ERC-20 token on the Ethereum blockchain that you would be able to push Doge into and out of. Um, there's so much overhead to do this work but Ethereum as a network actually has higher transaction fees than Dogecoin. So like, what's the, what's the point um, of doing this? Dogecoin has a 60 second block time, like near zero transaction fees. What's the benefit that users of that cryptocurrency get out of switching it over to the Ethereum blockchain? Very little. Um, and so for me, the way I kind of adjudicate or assess these things is I say, well, what's the benefit to end users, how would this help cryptocurrency get mainstream adoption or actual real world usage? And I don't think it would. I think it's a cool pet project. I think it's a cool hackathon idea. Um, but um, a lot of people, you know, I think because they were they they had a whole bag of Dogecoin, they were hoping it would pump the price. Were like Ethereum bridge, Ethereum bridge, and what's you know that that's crazy. Um, it's like I said, it's a hackathon idea. It's not actually something that I don't think people would really use on the regular. So you're saying you don't want to be able to collateralize your make or die using Dogecoin. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> so, I, I mean, I guess that leads into the question of, like, what are your, like, thoughts on how, like, the crypto space has evolved in the last five years or, and, you know, maybe in the last one year? And, you know, we see this movement towards DeFi or, and then, you know, the year before that was the D-Web and, like, what, do you, what, what are your thoughts on just like this general movement in the crypto space and these new ideas that are coming around? Yeah, for sure. I think it's a it's a it's been a game of shifting narratives. Um, I think I, I, I remember and you remember as well because you've been around for a long time in this industry. Years ago, people were talking about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as an actual medium of exchange. You know, this is going to be used to pay for uh, at restaurants and pay for food. And uh, there's a lot of people that like to claim that they never said that. I need to try and dig up recordings of them from presentations where I know that they said otherwise. Like, There's um, probably a lot of episode or episodes you could start digging in. Hey, great idea. Great idea. <laughs> but, you know, um, it's, it's in a shift in narratives, right? And um, so the the whole medium of exchange thing didn't happen because, you know, scalability was kind of the scapegoat for that. I actually, st I'm starting to question whether scalability was the real reason that Bitcoin didn't take off um, for, for real retail commerce. 
Um, but so then that shifted and then it moved to this whole store of value thing, right? So, oh no, we never said that crypto is a, is a, is a thing you should actually use as a currency. You should be using it, um, as a, as a place where, you know, it's akin to gold, right? It's just a thing where you store your wealth and it goes up in price over time. Um, and then that didn't really work out, um, because they realized that, you know, Hey, gold actually exists and so do stocks. Um, and so they're like, oh, okay, actually it's about DeFi. It's about, uh, you know, rebuilding, <laughs> rebuilding banks essentially, um, and, and large financial institutions in the blockchain, which, you know, we're starting to get into this comical territory, uh, where it's like, Hey guys, all those financial institutions you said you were going to completely demolish, um, and you know, all the hierarchies you said you were going to demolish, um, and because the blockchain would make people, it would give people liberty and they'd be able to be their own bank. You want to recreate all that bad stuff inside the blockchain. And it's like, okay, like you can see where this is going. Um, I, I don't really see the value in that. I think the, that already exists. Um, <laughs> and so the value of recreating it on a blockchain, um, to me doesn't have a lot of benefits because it actually makes the thing less efficient. Um, you know, it's centralized for a reason and that's because it can be super efficient. Um, you know, especially when you get to like these collateralized like loans and things like that, I just don't see a reason for doing that on in, in crypto. Um, so you have that whole side of it. And then, on, and, and I like to think of those people as, as, as the newcomers, right? So the whole DeFi movement, uh, typically people that I see have come into crypto late to the game, probably like 2016, 2017 onwards. Um, and so you have people like that, that pomp guy who's like, yeah, like crypto, liberty, like let's recreate banks inside crypto. Wait, what? Um, and then you have um, the OGs, right? So you have a whole bunch of people that have been around for a long time, the, the Bitcoin core developers, the lightning folks. Um, but then you look at what they're doing and they've kind of like hunkered down in a bunker and they're creating like these Rube Goldberg machines for sending, you know, transactions and, it, and it's baffling to me it's like um the the scaling solutions that we're coming up with like lightning and and all of that um are so 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 complex <laughs> that, that that um there is you know bitcoin is hard enough to get an average user of of, of venmo of of apple pay etc to just understand the concept of public and private keys backing up a seed phrase using a Bitcoin wallet. Then you have to layer in lightning channels and the fact that you need to have, you know, all these lightning channels established, routing needs to happen, multi-hop. Like from a user experience perspective, I don't see a way um, that they can kind of hide that efficiently um, that works and uses. And so it's a little bit sad to me because I feel like you've got people building impossible um, chaos machines in a basement um, and they're cool developers. They're, they're very smart. Like, I don't want to take away from from what Lightning and, and the likes of those teams are doing. And then you have like the institution folks who are all like DeFi, DeFi, let's let's turn this blockchain into a into a, you know, corporate capitalist thing. I, I, I really don't see a sizable enough population of people in the middle kind of saying, hey, what about using cryptocurrency to actually transact? Um, it's gone. It's gone. It just doesn't exist anymore. And I think um, the fact that we're at a point like I hoped that Ethereum was going to establish a lot of this and do a lot of this. Um, but the fact Ethereum is now rebranding as Ethereum 2.0, which a lot of people don't realize is is completely different to Ethereum. This isn't like just a patch to Ethereum. No, it's like, no, guys, Ethereum was a failure. Sorry, we need to completely re-architect the whole thing. I think that speaks volumes um, to how challenging it's going to be to actually just buy a cup of coffee with cryptocurrency. Um, so I don't know that that's where I stand. And as an outsider, like I have no financial incentives for this. I have no, it's not a job that I work in. And so I like to just call it as it is like as a product right now, I don't see how cryptocurrency is going to establish a uh, market fit or adoption. Yeah, totally. I mean, we actually, so we uh, just, few weeks ago, we did an episode with uh, Amari Sechet, who is one of the core developers of uh, Bitcoin Cash. And, yeah. you know, I might get some flack for this, but I think like, you know, the Bitcoin Cash community seems to be kind of trying to hit that middle ground you're talking about, like some, you know, just really focusing on scaling basic payments. And so, you know, I, I'm kind of hopeful there a little bit. I am too. You know, the, the, the sad thing that like I 
I absolutely agree with you there. I think that there are some good um, good goals. Um, I think the intent is right with things like Bitcoin Cash. I think, unfortunately, the ego that surrounds the characters involved on it in, in every way, every way you look, is really disappointing. But if it didn't have that attached to it, I think that would be actually really compelling. Uh, yeah. Totally. Yeah. So with all that, where do you think where do you think crypto is going and do you see any light at the end of the tunnel uh proverbially and 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 do you see any positive things come out of this space yeah yeah i do i i, I think that um ultimately uh cryptocurrency um is made up of, of of several parts right like satoshi's original invention wasn't completely net new it was uh it was it was satoshi was the glue that held together um, existing concepts such as uh, public key cryptography, uh, you know, um, hash chains, uh, you know, linked lists, essentially, um, you know, proof of work, which had already existed. It brought together these these several uh, components to make something that was, you know, uh, sum of all parts. And um, I think that some of that can be extracted and used to improve the quality of users' lives and improve society. Um, and so I still think that, you know, one thing that, that we've seen a huge um, need for just globally has been an increase in user security, right? People need to care more about secure passwords, authentication, um, you know, having some level of security over their own identity, things like that. Um, there are so many uh, kind of pieces of work that have gone into cryptocurrency that can be used for those purposes. Does it need a blockchain? Does it need a proof of work backed or a proof of stake backed network to do that? Absolutely not. Um, but can some of the, the, the contributing parts be extracted out and contribute back to society? Yes. I like to see the, the, the cryptocurrency networks as they currently stand, like things with a token um, or, a, or a huge network as really kind of like the the super forward thinking kind of like eventual point um, where you're just experimenting with stuff. But out, out of that should, should, should develop, hopefully, um, new developments in cryptography um, and just the way we think about security that can benefit everybody, even if it doesn't have to end up being on a blockchain. And so that, that's how I try to like paint the silver lining with this stuff, um, is that it's started a conversation in many cases about, um, you know, individuals having better control over their identity, their security, their money. Um, which I think is a good thing. So I'd like to circle back to you. And so you, you mentioned that you don't work in cryptocurrency or sorry, you don't work in the blockchain space. And so, I, you know, why did you step away from the project? I mean, you mentioned the whole NASCAR thing, but w was it something greater than that or was? Yeah, yeah. So I've always um, had a, a job outside of crypto. And so it wasn't really a matter of me like, leaving cryptocurrency as a job to move back into into just regular tech which is what i do um it was uh more just that was always what i was doing and crypto is my side project it's always been the case um and uh what kind of made me and the way that i work you know uh, crypto it hasn't been my only side project i've had many side projects over the years um the way I decide to work on a side project is if it gives me personal joy to work on that or I get something out of it in terms of like I'm learning. Um, and I think what's happened, the, the kind of peaks and troughs in my involvement in crypto have really correlated to how much I feel I can learn from the current industry. Um, and so when I left and moved away from crypto in 2015, I had very little involvement in crypto in 2015 and 2016. It was because um, I felt that all the conversations had shifted to these kind of startups that were like pitching, it's this on a blockchain. And, and it was just, I wasn't going to learn anything from them other than how to sell snake oil. And so I moved away. Um, when a lot of the stuff started happening in 2017 um, with smart contracts and, and a whole bunch of new concepts, I was like, I can learn something again. I'm going to go back into that. I'm going to create an educational YouTube series about it as a hobby um, because you know, when I, the, the thing, and I don't think a lot of people realize this, the YouTube videos that I create are, are not just for my audience, but also for me, because in researching them, I am learning about that thing. Um, and so that's the main reason I did it. Um, 
it was because I learned something. And then what happened, I found, is that uh, in late 2018, after I'd been doing it for about two years, um, I noticed a pattern as I started reviewing these different blockchain projects. I was like, they, they're, all the, they're all the damn same. And so I stopped learning anything again. And so more recently, I've kind of backed away from cryptocurrency again. You'll notice that my YouTube channel, we were talking before the show, has shifted to mechanical keyboard reviews um, because, you know, I find interest in that. I'm learning about something different. Um, cryptocurrency doesn't have anything to offer me personally right now. And that's kind of selfish in a way, but that's fine. Like I should only spend my time on things um, that, that I actually care about. Yeah, I, I, I kind of agree with you on, on some points there. And I mean, similarly, when 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 I started Epicenter and, and when uh, well, with Brian and when we met at, at back in 2013 or something, uh, my, my goal was very much to learn uh, about the technology. I mean, I had been in this space for less than a month when the podcast started. Um, so so in, in that sense, I understand. But I feel that I've constantly been learning things. I mean, I've learned so many things and I continue to learn things and my opinions have shif shifted and uh, I think that over the over the years, I've had periods where I've had doubts about the technology and about its ability to, you know, bring good into the world, and then other periods where I'm quite hopeful uh, and I see interesting things happening. Oh yeah, I, I still, you know, a lot of people think I'm just a, a negative Nancy pessimist about everything. Um, I do often see things that that get me excited. Um, I just, you know, they're few and far between. And so this YouTube channel that uh, that you've been doing now, I guess for about a year. I did it for about I've done it for about two years actually. Yeah. So you're 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 doing sort of these short uh, reviews of blockchains, or like I mean, you've also done some reviews of like hardware wallets and this sort of thing, and it's also somewhat tied into gaming. I feel like and you're reviewing these mechanical keyboards. Like, what's the goal here? What do you what do you see this becoming in the future? Is it just another side project or do you have a, a bigger goal here of maybe, you know, turning this into a business or an educational venture or something like that? Yeah, no, I, I have no, uh, I'm, I'm definitely not going to become a full time YouTuber because spoiler alert, it doesn't pay very well um, unless you're, you know, some sort of like video game streamer or something. But um no, again, like, as I said, it's a way for me to learn. And so I, I will post things on there from time to time now when I'm, I have something to talk about. Um, but I'm not going to become a professional tech YouTuber or something like that. It, it, it's really much just a hobby for me. Um, and so uh, I'm one of those people that I, I get really excited about things for about a year or so. And then I'm like, okay, on to the next thing. So um, I wouldn't be surprised. I'm, I'm currently trying to find another side project. Um, I'm thinking of doing something with decentralized social networking again because nobody's cracked that nut. Yeah, that's that's one thing that uh, perpetually I think keeps coming back and, and that people can't really find a solution to. Uh, yeah, it's hard. Very, very yeah. few have. Yeah. And so you mentioned that you you don't work in crypto and you, know, you it's it's known that you work at a, at a big uh, a software company. Uh, do you have any ambition to maybe? work in the crypto space, come back into the crypto space. I'm sure you've gotten, you've received many job offers over the years. Uh, is, is this something you've considered? Uh, not really. I, I don't have a strong enough belief in the, in the future of, of cryptocurrency uh, to warrant working on it full time yet. Um, it's the same as like if somebody said, hey, do you want to go and work for a VR startup? I'd be like, no. Uh, and um, I, I just... It's, it's too cutting edge for me um, and unproven. So no real desire to, you know, I, I, I toyed around with the idea of like potentially going and working for one of the, the, the larger uh, kind of more established and regulated companies in, in cryptocurrency. But um, yeah, I'm glad I didn't um, because I think they've uh, kind of, what I've noticed at least is a lot of those bigger companies have kind of lost their heart a little bit and uh, in the name of profit. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that I've kind of, the, the other reason I'm glad about this is because it also not working in cryptocurrency, um, reduces the bias. Um, I think that I, had I worked at cryptocurrency companies the last five years that I've been in the space, um, would have in some way, um, even if indirectly, um, contributed to some bias in my opinions about things. 
Um, and uh, I'm glad I haven't had that. It's kept me grounded to not be involved in it day to day. And so, you know, we mentioned at the beginning of uh, this, ep- near the beginning, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're one of the domain name squatters when you have an interesting idea. Mm-hmm. And so any of those domain names, like, you know, that are particularly interesting to you and, you know, anything that, you know, the viewers might find intriguing or at least amusing and anything, <laughs> you, any of those side pro- ter- might be turning into side projects anytime soon? What's in your what's in your GoDaddy account? <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that. I I literally just went through and uh, turned off auto renew on all of my all of my domains. I don't have a good one right now. I uh, okay. I was working on a side project for a little bit there uh, called Chime, which was kind of a, a Twitter alternative, uh, and uh, it was open source. I I, I I think my next thing will be getting back into that. You mentioned Mastodon earlier. I I'm a big fan of Mastodon, which is a decentralized social network, a federated so- social network, I should say. Um, I kind of want to get back into that uh, area because I, I think that there's an increasing um, increasing demand for, for an alternative to, say, Facebook specifically. Um, and uh, that company is just evil at this point. And so there needs to be a, an alternative. I wholeheartedly agree with that statement, uh, but we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, Jackson, thanks for coming on today, and uh, it was great to talk to you, and hopefully we'll have you back on at some point in the future. If you decide to come back in the crypto, maybe you'll launch the, the next meme coin, and uh, you'll have to come back Who on knows? and talk about that as well. <laughs> or, or a decentralized social network. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks. We release new episodes of Epicenter every week. Click here to subscribe for hundreds of insightful interviews with some of the leading minds in blockchain and crypto. You can also listen to the audio version of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcast apps. Click here for a full list of places where you can listen. Thanks for watching Epicenter, and we hope you'll join us for our next episode.